South Georgia is an uninhabited subantarctic island. It didn't ever have an indigenous population. And still today, there are no permanent human inhabitants on this wild, glacier-strewn island. There are tens of millions of seabirds and marine mammals, which call the island home. The first definite sighting of South Georgia was made in 1675 by Antoine de la Roche, an English merchant born to a French father. Captain James Cook made the first landing in 1775 and took possession, naming the island the Isle of Georgia in honour of King George III. The bay where Cook claimed the island is known as Possession Bay and is still home to the glacier he documented. Captain Cook then sailed east and discovered eight of the South Sandwich Islands, naming the group after Lord Sandwich, who at the time was the first Lord of the Admiralty. The remaining three islands of the South Sandwich group were discovered by Fabian Gottlieb von Bellinghausen in 1819. South Georgia was made famous by Ernest Shackleton's adventurous crossing of the island to rescue his men from his wrecked ship, the Endurance. This is the pass here that Shackleton came down. A hundred years ago, there was a lot more snow and ice. He slid down those slopes, came down to this valley and crossed these plains. And at that time, the glacier at the back, the Koenig Glacier, that was over a thousand meters longer. It stretched all the way down to where I'm standing. He crushed that glacier, climbed over to the back towards salvation and safety. Ernest Shackleton crossed this ridge and finally his ordeal was over. He could see the whaling station of Stromness down in the valley below. But long before Shackleton's visit, over the late 19th century, the islands had been targeted by sealers who came to hunt the millions of fur seals for their valuable pelts and the elephant seals for their oil-rich blubber. But perhaps the most significant chapter in the human history of South Georgia opened with the arrival of Carl Larsen, a Norwegian whaler who established the first whaling station on the island in 1904. The Southern Ocean is home to immense numbers of whales that migrate here to feed on krill during the summer season. They include the blue whale, the largest animal that has ever existed on Earth. Seven whaling stations were established in total, with over 3,000 men working on the island each summer. The whalers hunted the great whales across the Southern Ocean to the shores of Antarctica. And over six decades, tens of thousands of whales were killed. The whale population in the Southern Ocean collapsed, making whaling unprofitable. In the 1960s, the stations were abandoned. And they remain today largely as how they were when the whalers left. And this pipe here that feeds from this tank, this is still dripping whale oil, 40 years old, still draining from this vast container. The bones from some of these whales still litter the beaches today. The skeletons of many of the great whales that were slaughtered over the last century or so, they're still here, preserved in the cold. Their testimony to the bloody past and unfortunately a reminder for the future. And the future of whales in Antarctic waters is uncertain. Efforts to make the Southern Ocean a permanent whale reserve were recently blocked and several of the whaling nations are seriously discussing the resumption of commercial whaling of many whale species, 
including even endangered humpbacks. It really makes you wonder whether we've learned nothing at all from our past mistakes. Jimmy Smith is an ex whaler who worked in the stations of South Georgia. It's all great vicin. That's as it is now, more or less. Yeah. Well, once you get ashore and get your job, that they tell you what to do, where you to work, and everything, and uh, you meet up with other fellows, Norwegians and maybe Dutch and Danes uh, and Englishmen, Shetlanders, and you got together and you worked together, and uh, that's how you got on. They all, all a good crowd. You got up at six in the morning. Went to your mess room, had a cup of coffee, go to work, back to the mess room for 20 minutes for your breakfast, nothing more till one o'clock for your lunch, and then you'd had nothing else now, then till six o'clock when you went for your tea. And then you had 20 minutes, half hour for your tea, and then you stop, and you go back to work for overtime for three hours. At Leith Harbour, I think in the summer, there'd be about 18. Yeah, 1800. 1800? Yeah. Well, so we had... Uh, at that one station at Leith Harbour? Yeah, yeah. They'd have one, one time during the summer to fish for sperm whale. And then after that, I think it was somewhere about four or five weeks, sperm whale. And then after that, they'd go back to the, the fin whale. Right. That's a, the whale with the fin on his back. And that could have been... Uh, blue whale, sow whale, fin whale, humpback whale, but they were not allowed to kill the uh, right whale because he had a, a f funny big jaw and he was like an old daddy, very slow swimmer and just used to lay on the water and blow. Now that's the gun there, look. Yeah. That's the, the piece sticking out, the harpoon there, and that's the whale there. Was the cannon quite accurate or what was it like firing? Oh, it was accurate, but you see, you've got the the boat going up and down and rolling this way, and the whale going this way. So, yeah. the gunner, or the Norwegian gunner, he's pretty accurate. He'd be standing like this, holding this thing. He'd be turning this way and this way and up yeah. and down, and then he'd be watching, and he'd get it finer this way and that way. Yeah. And in the end, he'd look down the barrel on his sight, okay. and he'd see the piece he wanted, and he'd pull the trigger, yeah. and this would run out. Okay. W wasn't very quick. Really? But once it hit the whale and went in there, okay. that was it. They had it worked to an art because when a whale first come up to blow, okay. uh, he'd take in air and then he'd go down and he'd come up again a few minutes after that. And then sometimes, as they called it, he would sound and go very deep. On the catcher again, they had an had, uh, electric thing which were used during the Second World War, ASDIC. Okay. And if there was a submarine down there, this ASDIC would go to it and it'd go ping, ping. So they put them on the whale boats. So when the whale was down, they'd switch this lot on and they'd say, well, the whale's down 20 fathoms because you could hear the ping. Wow. And as he come up, the ping had come up. And they said, well, the whale's ahead or the whale's 10 degrees to starboard or something like that. So they'd go that way. Poor old chap didn't have any chance. No. Although the numbers of whales and seals were decimated, and in some cases reduced to less than 1% of their natural levels, just enough of each species survived. Today, the whales and seals are strictly protected across South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands, but also more widely throughout the Southern Ocean. The populations of these magnificent animals are now recovering. And they're filling the waters around South Georgia once more.
This film was made possible by the South Georgia Heritage Trust, the Friends of the British Overseas Territories, and the Don Hansen Charitable Foundation.